How you doing, Rock Family? Good? All right. Well, my name is uh, Drew Tevis. I'm the youth pastor here, here at The Rock. And it's such a blessing for me to uh, share Youth Sunday with all of you and to highlight some of our students. We had Lauren sing the national anthem. Awestruck was up here. And Jason Matthews Band, they're one of our high school uh, bands. And um, this is amazing. We have our youth in the house. I see some youth. All right, dude. Yep, this is where your parents are every week. Uh, we are off on the third, third floor. And um, again, uh, I've been here at The Rock for about 10 years. And I actually started uh, volunteering. I was cleaning trash cans and answering phones. And then in 10 years, I've made my way all the way to the top youth pastor. So that's how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> Stop. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> But we at The Rock, you know, all the pastors and, and Miles, we have a pastor who is all about youth. And our goal is really to reach the uh, youth of San Diego. And when we say youth, we're not only talking about just, just teenagers, but we have a young heart at The Rock and we have a young mind at The Rock. And that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about today. But um, I have a video uh, of Miles actually speaking to some of our youth. So mind you, I'm in the video, but I did not make the video. Okay? So let's roll the video. Excuse me, Pastor Miles, I was wondering if you had any pastoral words of wisdom for the youth. If you want to be beautiful, just think beautiful thoughts. Excuse me, Pastor Miles, when you were my age, what did you do to get some girls? Huh? <laughs> Check me out, I'm single. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> really? That worked? What did you do after that? I would do it, but there's not enough room up here for me. Come on, please, man. Come on, come on. Come on. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Really? That's really odd. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's not. But here's what I'm saying. It's incredible. Nice. Do you think that would work if I tried it? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> so, Pastor Miles, what are some of the issues that are facing our youth today? Uh, they, they, they're like this big. They're like this big. Really? What else? Some haven't taken a shower or bath in months. Yeah, so on my way in, I saw Pastor Mickey in the parking lot. What, what, he, what was he up to? He's cutting you off in the parking lot, see if you curse. Thanks, Thanks Pastor Miles. All right. <laughs> so, you guys, as you can see, our pastor, he has a lot of words of wisdom for our youth. And uh, that's what happens to get some youth with some, uh, you know, some video editing skills. So... As I said, I did not make the video. I'm just in the video. So I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to get in trouble. But uh, welcome to July 4th. Uh, I was driving to a church today, and I drive along Mission Bay, and I just saw, like, families out there at 5 o'clock in the morning at, you know, uh, trailers and just everything out there. And today is just a really great day to bring families together, and it's a great day to talk about generations. And um, when I was a, a young boy, um, when I grew up, I grew up in the islands. I grew up in Hawaii. And um, thank you. Um, and uh, our, what, what we do there is it's just a small island, so we are all about just family and fireworks. We can have, it's like fireworks, or I don't know how we get them, I think illegally, we just have fireworks. If you can hold a mosquito punk, it, you, you get light fireworks. So we just have fireworks and then the, the, like the town parade. I walked in so many parades as like a Boy Scout, as a, like an, an Indian guides, I think. I was like, I had the feathers and then like as a little league team, you know, like woo. And then as a clown, I drove, I rode a bike. And all we did is like July 4th was parade and then go to the beach and have families, hundreds of family there, everyone's, everyone's family. And just coming together is such a great time uh, as, a, as a youngster um, just on July 4th. And as I got older, I realized like, wow, you know, July 4th has a little bit more historical like significance, right? <laughs> I didn't know. So I had to go on Wikipedia because Wikipedia is like the, the New King James version of uh, information, Right. So I learned, you know, I'm awesome, obviously being, uh, you know, kiddingly, but in 1776, we had the American Revolution, of course, and it was really about a group of men 
who decided, you know what, we're tired of being, you know, raised in this kind of a government. We're going to break free from a British government and we're going to make a, a new nation because we want something for our kids. We want something for the next generation, right? So 56 men drafted up the Declaration of Independence. And here's a fun little fact, because I like these fun facts, is that two of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence became president, okay? John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. You're like, I knew that. Well, I didn't, okay? But here's, this is kind of cool. I love these cool facts, is that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, this is weird, actually died on July 4th, 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the, of the nation. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, who knew that? You did? Oh, you don't, come on, dude, for real? That's like, that's straight jeopardy. You know what I mean? Who was Thomas Jefferson and John Adams? Like, wow, wow. Well, today I'm going to actually talk about, you know, another generational piece is the story of Joshua and Caleb, two men who were raised as slaves in a generation that were under oppression and slavery. And they, Joshua and Caleb are the original, the OG youth pastors because they are the only ones that took the next generation into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. Today's message is called milk and honey. Okay? So that's what, that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, if you guys could uh, turn to the book of Numbers, the fourth book. Of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I always remember, general electric light bulbs never die. Say something for you. Unless they're fluorescent lights, I guess. But I really want to challenge you guys to think about today is to be like Joshua and Caleb. To be young-minded intentionally raising up the next generation. And it's not an age thing. Okay, it's not an age thing. It's a young-minded thing. And you'll be blessed that really the future of our church is in raising up the next generation. Parents, church, everyone investing in, in the next generation. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for, uh, for our freedom. Lord, as Americans, we're free. And Lord, in Christ we are free. And Lord, you're all about taking us from slavery into the light from our Egypt into the promised land and Lord it's a long process and Lord I pray that as we oftentimes get in our ways or sit in our ways that we can become just stagnant and stale and just used to tradition and Lord I pray that we could have young minds and have a childlike faith and Lord I thank you for July 4th and for bringing family together thank you for the youth being in the um in the auditorium today, Lord. And I thank you for parents who continue to invest in their children and realize that this is a great place for them to be formed spiritually. And you pray, amen. Amen. Well, let me give you a snapshot before we enter the book of Numbers 13. Is that before the book of Numbers, we have the book of Exodus. Say Exodus. Exodus is the story of God's people exiting slavery. They're in slavery for over 400 years, right? And here you have Moses who is God's chosen servant to lead them out of Israel. You've seen the movies. Okay, the Red Sea, the man from heaven, the ten plagues, all that was Moses. Now we have Joshua and Caleb, our Moses' successors. And now they're faced with exiting slavery with their generation on the border of the promised land, which is Canaan. Say Canaan. It's modern day Israel, land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3.8 says the land was flowing with milk and honey. That's why we say milk and honey. Okay. Um, not milk and honeys. But milk and honey. <laughs> Some of you think, wow, okay, perfect. Um, and as you continue to read the book of Numbers and the book of Joshua, you're going to see all these incredible battles that the Lord, the Lord's hand was in these battles. Like Jericho. Remember Jericho, if you know the story, they marched around the city and all they did was shout and the walls came down. Total God's hand, hand was uh, in it. Um, at the end of possessing the land, in Joshua 21, you don't have to turn there. It says this. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he had sworn to give their fathers. And they took possession of it and settled there. Just as he had sworn to their forefathers. The Lord gave them rest on every side. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed over all their enemies to them. Not one of any of the good promises to the house of Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. 
So we see the Lord, the Lord is in it, right? The Lord gave them everything. Nothing to worry about. That was at the end. But let's back up. Let's back up because I'm going to have to answer a question here. Is that 40 years prior to this, when Joshua and Caleb were on the verge of entering the promised land, they just came out of slavery and the Red Sea and manna from heaven and the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day and water from the rock. Yet, for some reason, God did not allow them to enter the promised land. Big question, right? Why? Why weren't they ready? Well, I think it's because, obviously, lack of faith and then a lack of childlike faith. See, we all have to enter the kingdom like a child. And Jesus welcomed the children. And I have a verse, Mark 10, you, got, you, know, got it, uh, you can mark it later. Mark 10, 14 says, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So we have to have a humble heart and enter, enter to God's presence like a child and be young-minded. Well, let's turn to your lesson plan. You have a lesson plan? I made one. I got seven Ps, okay. The do something book, Miles got five Ps. I got seven, okay. Just seven is a complete number. Seven. I'll start with P. It's like a homiletics thing. It's cool. Okay. We're going to pick up a story in Numbers chapter 13, actually 1 through 20. It sets the stage where, Mo, where Moses picks 12 spies, one spy for every right tribe. And in the 12 spies, we have Joshua and Caleb. Joshua means the Lord of salvation. Caleb means faithful. So if your name is Joshua, that's your name means. Caleb means faithful. Okay. So here we go. We're going to pick up a story up in verse 17. And it says, when Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, say Canaan. He said to them, go up there to the Negev and then go up into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land because now was the time of the first ripe grapes. Okay? God has a plan for all of us. Some of our life verses, you have a, what's your life verse? Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. Why? Because God, it says, God's a plan for you, plan not to harm you, but to give you hope in the future, right? It's like, oh, that's a, that's a great verse. Let's mark that one. In the youth wall, it says, Ephesians 2 10, you know, for you are God's workmanship. Creating Christ Jesus to do good works which he already has prepared beforehand. So God has a plan for our life. But we often think because that's, we're so self-centered and narcissistic. It's a, it's a big word for me, a youth pastor, right? Can't spell it. It's narcissistic. Self-centered. We think that the destination is like our ultimate goal. The Canaan, we are all ready to go to Canaan. Although the kingdom of God is at hand, we are right on the verge of entering Canaan. And a lot of us are be wandering dead forever. But we think the destination is where, it's, is where it's at. But God has all of us in a process. But it's in the process that we become holy. It's not when we get to the destination. Okay, it's in the process that we become holy. On your notes, on the, the blank it says, the plan for God for you is to be holy. Be holy. That's God's plan. And God's ways of getting us there are not always our ways. God's ways are not our ways. We think in order for me to be holy, this is what God's going to do in my life. For me to be a full Christian, um, these, these things are going to have to line up, right? We already came through the desert. We already came through this kind of stuff. Now we're going to go into the land and we're going to see some excuses of what, why Israel why God, why Israel let, didn't let, allow themselves to go into the land. And that would be the position. Positionally, we are at this same area. Let's check this out. In verse 26, it says this. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, it took them 40 days to spy out the land, biblical time, a number of testing, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all their congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Ba-boom. Okay. It said that they brought back fruit. Two dudes had to carry these large things of grapes. That's some big grapes. 
All right, and the little red seedless grapes. I don't know what kind of grapes these were, but that was to show the land was fruitful. All right, that's their positionally. It goes on to say this. I'm going to keep, keep reading. 27, thus they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us and certainly it flows with some milk and honey. And this is the fruit. Boom. But, say but. But. NIV says but. This says nevertheless. The people who lived in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country. And the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of every single Jordan. Here's the position that God has us in is that we have the promised land, the kingdom of God is at hand. But positionally, we sometimes see with our eyes because we walk by sight and not by faith. That no matter what's in our way, right, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the mosquito bites, whatever it was, right, it's, a, it's ultimately a spiritual battle. It's ultimately a spiritual battle. Like God has a plan for life to be holy. You can walk in it and walk in his promises, but things are going to be in your way. We have ministry starting here all the time at the Rock Church. That's what we do. People get involved in ministry. It's not like have an idea for ministry and it's just like, bam, the next week. It's a process. It's a process for you guys to start ministries or to get into ministry. When you start to go do something for the Lord, you better believe there's going to be stuff in your way. Serious? And that's what they were faced with. It's always a spiritual battle. But if it's, if it's God's in it, it's going to be good. If it's all God, it's all good. Right? I mean, we should say that, huh? If it's all God, it's all good. good. See the power of everybody saying something. Also, too, the devil is going to be telling you lies. The devil is going to be telling you lies. He's going to be counterfeiting God's word. You know he knows God's word and he's going to distort it. That's not what God said. He did it to Eve, didn't he? Right? That's not what God said. He said, if you, if you ate it, you're not going to die. There's no way. He's going to change it. And he'll be listening. Who are you going to be listening to? God or the enemy? Okay. Um, they had a big but problem. Okay. But the land is good. But there's all this stuff in my way. What's our but problem? Right. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got a big old butt. No, for real. You got a big old butt. What's your butt problem? Well, I want to walk in with God, but uh, church on Sunday, I work. You know what I mean? I got to go, but oh, wow, I want to get involved in me. Uh, we have a lot of excuses. And excuses are like bad breath. We all got it. It all stinks. What's your butt problem? The position Get your butt out of the way. Get your butt out of the way. Here you want to say it. <laughs> the procedure. How are we going to enter the land? The procedure. Here's Caleb. Caleb's my, Caleb's my boy. It says Caleb's my dog. Actually, the, there's a like symbol for, for Caleb is dog. I don't know why, but maybe it's Joshua's dog. It's Joshua's dog. He was a guy. Caleb quiets the people. Number 1330 says this. Then Caleb quieted the people. He's like, hey, right? Caleb stood up, quieted the people before Moses and said, We should all, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. Why was Caleb so certain we would overcome it? Because God already delivered them from right? Egypt. They parted the Red Sea. That was God. It wasn't like they just had a, a boat. The Red Sea parted and they walked through it. Caleb's like, uh, guys, remember what God just did? Let's go for it. Right? If it's all God, it's all good. Okay? That's what Caleb, he, was, he had a different spirit. That's what it said later on in Numbers. That Caleb had a different spirit. It's real simple. It's real simple. The procedure is obey God. Obey God. How to walk their promised land, a land of milk and honey. Obey God. Caleb was being simple. God said it. Let's go do it. No buts. Then we have the problem. Okay. The fourth P. The problem. Here's the problem. They had grasshopper mentality. What? What do you mean? Okay. Well, it's right here. It's in the Bible. Check it out. Verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him... We are not able to go up against, that's my whiny voice. 
We are not able to go up against the people for they are too strong for us. So they gave out, so they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land which we have gone and spying out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now, interesting because they were spying. And if you're a good spy, you're not going to be seen by them. And they made up a story. We are like grasshoppers. They had grasshopper mentality or, or small-mindedness, right? That's a big but problem, having grasshopper mentality. What is grasshopper mentality? Well, I defined it with some C's. I had the P's, now I have the C's. Okay, check this out. 14. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. Say cried. And cried and the people wept that night. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in this wilderness. So they're like, we're going to die, we're gonna die either way. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? where we were slaves. We didn't even want to try. Let's go back to Egypt and die as slaves. Really? Wow. Okay. So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in, in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation and said to Israel. So they cried. That's in your notes. They cried. Wah, it's too hard. Being a Christian and walking with God is hard. Really? Duh. Who sold you something different? Right? It's not a timeshare. It's hard, right? We're going to cry. There's a lot of opportunities. God's going to give you opportunities to grow, okay? Number two, I have, they complained. And not only did they complain, they complained in groups. You ever get people around you like God saying, ah, wow, man, my life, and just start complaining and start getting other people on their side. Let's complain in groups. We don't like this. We don't want to be under authority. We want to be in authority, Right? My small group leaders say, ah, pff, uh, mumble, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. Let's get a new leader. Forget this dude, all right? It's my right. New leader, get him out, all right? Caleb and Joshua want to walk by faith. Psh, they want to stone him. <laughs> That's what they said. Look in verse 10. But all the congregation said, said to stone them with stones. Why? Because Joshua and Caleb like, God said it, let's go. We just came out of the Egypt uh, across the Red Sea. And they're like, stop talking, let's stone them. Let's cry, let's grumble, let's complain. Wow, then they start making up stories. They start making up stories. All our children are going to die. Really? They had conversations in their head. A lot of times our spiritual battle is in our mind, right? We have conversations in our head. You ever had a conversation like with, with the enemy, right? Like, oh, and he starts telling you lies, you start believing, and you start to have these vain imaginations. I'm going to go confront this person. Well, they're going to say this, right? We came from marriage retreat. A lot of, you know, not all, a lot of marriages are, they're not quite walking in the promised land because they don't want to face these things because like, well, they have, I have these conversations. She's going to say this. I'm going to react like this. Oh my, really? Who told you this? It's a conversation in your brain. Conversation is a C. It's not in your notes, but it's a freebie. Okay? Because we all have conversations in our brain. Okay? Because the enemy is speaking to us in our brain. And they conformed. They want to go back. This is, this is crazy. They want to go back to Egypt. Oftentimes we, want to, we are so comfortable in our sin, we want to go back to our sin. God says, just give me a little bit more, give me a little bit more, and we're afraid of what that looks like. Man, if I sell out my, if I die for Christ, and what's it going to look like? I'm so comfortable to go back to my sin, you know. We as a church, we are family, we are for hurting people. We have a lot of people coming through our doors. A lot of people are struggling with addictions, suicide, and bondage, and slavery just to sin. And God wants to take you out of slavery into the light, from darkness to freedom. And it's right there. And yet so much we want to go back to our sin. You may think you're the only one. Man, I continue to try to repent for the same thing. At youth camps, you do like a, here's a stick. Write your sin on the stick and throw it in the fire. You know? And it's like every, every year, like the kids tell me, I write the same thing down. It's just so, we're so comfortable to go back to our sin, back to our, maybe it's an abusive relationship. I don't know. You know? That might hit home for somebody. 
go back to this because it's comfortable. I know it. Because at least in this sin I had food, a place to live, someone to take care of me. Whatever it is, those are excuses. It's a spiritual battle. And they were confused. The last thing, they were confused. They forgot in the dark what God showed them in the light. Say it again. They forgot in the dark, in the mess, in the heat of the moment, they forgot in the dark what God shown them in the light. Literally, God was a pillar of fire by night that they were led by. Okay? I don't know how many of you have been, are led by a pillar of light and a cloud and the Red Sea parted. You know what I'm saying? But God has done some things in your life. You have to remember what he's done. Write those things down. My wife and I, we have a, a spiritual blessing book. Of all things God blesses us with. So that in times of trouble, we're like, man, look what God did. Here, 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 here. God's promise is faithful. He's going to come through. Don't forget in the dark what God's shown you in the light. Write down, down. That's a good one. Okay. Here's the penalty. Fifth P, the penalty. Numbers 14, 28 through 29. Fourteen, twenty-eight, twenty-nine. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. <laughs> the penalty is that that whole entire generation died in the wilderness. Do you know that the promised land was about a 10-day walk? I don't know if you know that. They could have walked 10 days, you know. In a car, they could have just driven to like Oceanside. I don't know. That's how close it was. But yet they, God said, because you're grumbling and complaining, you're just going to die right here. And God actually was going to kill all of them. And then Moses pleaded with them and said, God, that might look bad, you know what I'm saying? Because you got to let some people go, okay. <laughs> He's like, okay, 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 cool. I'm going to let Caleb and Joshua enter the promised land. That's what the prize is. Look at the prize. Oh, the penalty, sorry. In your notes, some of your note takers, wander in the desert. That's the penalty. Wander in the desert. You can also put die. <laughs> die. God killed them. Miles would say killed. Right? Let's look at the prize. Numbers 14, 24. Here's the prize. But my servant Caleb, say Caleb, because he had a different spirit and has followed me, I will bring into the land, I will bring into the land which he entered and his descendants shall take possession of it. Only Caleb and Joshua out of two million that came out of Egypt entered the promised land. They were one in a million. That's the prize. They're a one in a million kind of guy. Only Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land with their descendants. So Caleb got to take all his kids into the promised land. Isn't that amazing? Wow. You know, we're not young men, like a faith, man. Our kids suffer. The church kids suffer. Your kids suffer. It's our job to model that in their life and invest in them. Amen? That's what. And look at verse 38. But Joshua, the son of Nun, he, he, didn't, have a, he didn't have a parents, I guess. The son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive out of those men who went about the land. You don't have to turn it, but in Joshua 14.10, this is what it says. This is what Caleb says. After he entered the promised land, it took 25 years to enter the promised land. Caleb's an older gentleman. Okay. He says, so here I am today, 85 years old. 85. Right. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle as I was then. This dude's 85 years old. He's like, I'm still as strong today as I was then. I have a young mind. Check this out. It's not an age thing. Investing in youth is not an age thing. Here's a picture of one of our top youth leaders right here up, up on the wall. This is Richard. Richard's my neighbor. You got it? Right? He's 85 years, years old. Okay? There he is. <laughs> yep. He's like, hey. Okay? That's that camp. Every year Richard goes to camp. The last three years I've taken him to camp. I really believe that I've extended his life because he looks forward to camp. And when I'm at camp, I'm like, this could be Richard's last camp, kid. So, you know, <laughs> don't hurt him. He's like, hey. I'm like, don't worry. He can't even hear what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? But, 
But Richard loves camp. He's on the zip line. You know, I'm like, ah. You know, I don't know. Just, a memorial at camp is going to be like, that's where we're going to be. Camp Amp, be like, Camp Richard. Because Richard goes to camp. He's my neighbor. He always talks about camp. Like December. We're going to camp again. I'm like, yeah, bro, we're going to camp. You know what I mean? He's like wearing his camp shirt. It's like all yellow style. Richard, let me get some clothes. He's, the kids, students love him. He does all these tricks. He's fine, you know, like, hey, look at this. I'm like, ah, oh, Richard, we saw that one already. You know what I mean? The, like, oh, oh, Grandpa Richard, he's amazing. 85 years old, loving kids. We're blessed. The prize, enjoy some milk and honey. <laughs> Here's the principle. Where's the principle in all this? Is that, you know, in order to, rate, uh, to get to, into the promised land, we have to intentionally be raising up the next generation, right? It's not the future of the church. They're now. They're now. Students and being young-minded and we have a young church, we are now, all right? Intentionally raise up the next generation. Here's a little challenge for, for parents. I'm a parent. I have two daughters. And it's my job, really, to model what God is like in their life. Not to, it's to train them up. It says train up your children, not tell them up. Tell them up, drop them off, right? <laughs> to see the spiritual formation versus extracurricular activities. There's a whole lot of extracurricular activities we, there's offering our students, right? Pamphlets here. And my daughter went to a music camp uh, last week. It was great. She's four. We're like, oh, wow. She's, she's not all yelling, right? But extracurricular activities versus spiritual formation. We got a camp coming up, you know? Invest in your kids' lives. This is the, the youth, God designed youth. This, George Barna, a great re, a Christian researcher, said that 50% of salvations happen before a student turns 15 years old. You know that? That youth are, in the, are the most spiritual hunger, hungry uh, humans in the world. That if a student doesn't accept the Christ before they end, leave high school, there's a 6% chance that they'll make a decision. The older we get, the less impacted we are by the gospel. If you notice that. Okay, the older we get, the less impacted we are because we're, we have, it's not an age thing, it's a, it's a heart thing, it's a young-minded thing. Um, here's some things we got is that uh, our church, here can we do as a, as, as a church, is that um, we have a lot of, as you saw, awestruck Bible clubs. We have kids doing Bible clubs. This past three months, the youth did like 30 do-something projects. They are hungry to get involved. But also, this is what breaks my heart, is that I've talked to parents this last month, true, okay, I get calls almost every week of what's happening in their lives of their youth is that a mom called me and said, hey, Pastor Drew, my daughter is cutting herself, but she's going online because there's online chat rooms of the best ways to cut yourself. Maximum hurt, minimum, like, you know, evidence. Wow. You know, I've talked to three moms that said their junior high boys are downloading pornography, not only on the computer at home, on their handheld PlayStation. You didn't know that, huh? Like, I want to buy my kid a PlayStation. Okay. You know, how much is that? Oh, price of camp? Ooh. You know, it's really, that's what we're dealing with. Kids are on the iPhones, on their phones, and their parents in the car. The enemy has a plan for our youth. But so do we. But so do we, right? Right. I challenge you to pray for our youth. If you're a parent, invest in your child. Pray for them. Love them. Talk to them. If you're 85 years old, we have camp coming up. <laughs> Any single 85-year-old ladies that got a guy, Richard. Man. You know what I'm saying? And then the milk and honeys right there. Okay. I'm going to invite the worship team up. Jason Matthews, our, one of our high school bands, coming up here, guys. They're going to exit with a song. I encourage you to visit our camp booth. There's a like Sick rocket out there. You saw the rocket? That's the bomb, dude. That's awesome. They're like, can you ride it? Yeah, for a quarter. Just kidding. Let me pray. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be on a journey. Thank you that you just want us to be holy, God. You want us to be faithful and to obey you. And you have a plan, Lord. We know the end of the story. We know we're going to be with you one day in a glorified body. And our pain and suffering will be gone. Lord, I pray for people here who are stuck in bondage, who are stuck in slavery, who are stuck in the dark, who have excuses. I pray in your name that you loose them, Lord, and you'd bless them. 
And Lord, I thank you for the youth of this church. Lord Jesus, we love you and praise you. Everybody says, amen. Amen. Right. Amen. So we're going to give praise right now to God. It's a brand new day. We give thanks for the youth. This is Youth Sunday, right? So before you walk out, we want to just declare that it's a brand new day. So I'm going to say something, and I need y'all to repeat brand new day. You ready? Listen, I'm going to say something like this. This ain't the past. It's a brand new day. This ain't the past. It's a brand new day. It's a declaration. So let's declare at the top of our lungs that it's a brand new day. A youthful day. A brand new day. We're going to have young minds today, right? This ain't the past. It's a... Let me hear you. Come on. This ain't the past. It's a... This ain't the past, it's a brand new day. Here we go, one by one, hey. Listen, here it goes, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. He woke me, raised me, gave me a brand new day. So I sing a new song, there's troubles in my way, but my faith is strong. Signs of a mustard seed, all we need to get by, just to get by, just to get by. Why well, I try to do it all by myself, have a God in heaven that yearns to help. But I know that life is sometimes horrible, sometimes incredible, sometimes it bores you. God's love, it always remains the same, even though we disobey, he never will forsake you. We don't have to walk this walk independently. We are his children, why don't we depend on he? And let us lay aside every weight and sing a new song to the Lord on this new day. This ain't the past, it's a brand new day. Come on and say the past, it's a brand new day. Let me hear you. This ain't the past. This ain't the past, it's a brand new day. Then it goes, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Lamb of God. The first fruit of my lips I give. So please be pleased with this awful ring of praise. Even if the rain keeps falling on my face. Even if the waves keep crashing. Thunder keeps sounding. Wind still blowing. Ha. Even if the lightning's flashing. Sin breakers dashing. Storm clouds showing. Ha. Even if the bills all pass through. Don't let the chance to bless God pass you. Take a second right now. Give my God some praise. Lift them hands in the air. Tell him that he's worthy. You're worthy, Lord, of this living sacrifice. Your yoke is easy and your burdens are light. I let this whole earth know he's my everything on this new day, a new song. Come on, this ain't the past, it's a brand new day. This ain't the past, it's a brand new day. This ain't the past, it's a brand new day. This ain't the past, it's a brand new day. lose control if you know that God's in control put your hands in the air let me see you just lose control if you know that God's in control put your hands in the air let me see you just lose control if you know that God's in control lose control he saved your soul lose control and let him know come on this ain't the past it's a brand new day this ain't the past it's a brand new day come on this ain't the past it's a the past, it's a brand new day. God bless you, Rock Church.